So this is the ecology and management section, and I guess this is going to be the ecology section of the ecology and management section. Um, it's a little bit out there, I think, relative to some of you. But if you bear with me, I'll bring this around to why you actually care. So, um, so here we go. All right. So I'm going to talk about some work that we've been doing along with Chris Wallace, um, looking at interactions between the psyllid and plant viruses and LSO. All right, so I think anyone that's been here, and certainly if anyone ever talks to Cecilia Tamarind, the guy, has seen some variation on this picture, right? This is sort of the, the base interactions that we have with the psyllid, um, right? You have the insect, you have the pathogen, this is LSO, in fact, that it vectors, you have a plant, and then you have all these different ways that they can affect each other, at least theoretically, right? And, you know, we generally are worried about, you know, the insect giving the, taking the pathogen, putting it in the plant. We're worried about the insect taking it up from the plant and sort of all these ways they can interact. And there's a lot of examples of how these things can happen. Um, one, one of them, the more important ones probably to us, is that Asian citrus psyllid has been examined. And what we've, they found is that ACP actually prefers to go to infected plants um, relative to uninfected. So they have a choice of a, tr of a citrus tree that has... Um, HLB or not, they will go to the HLB infected tree. Um, there's a similar, there's similar things that happen in cucumber mosaic virus, um, uh, tomato leaf curl, yellow leaf curl China virus. So in all these cases, it turns out that the infection with the pathogen changes the vector's behavior. Um, and this is sort of for ecological reasons and behavioral reasons. And the idea is that the pathogen is making the plant do things or the rather the pathogen is making the insect do things that allow it to transmit itself better, right? The pathogen looking at for its own interests. Um, and we even have some, very, some studies in the potato psyllid. So Seth Davis looked at this sort of phenomenon. What he found is that if you give the choice, and Joe, that if you give the insect the choice of infected and uninfected plants, early on they're going to go to the infected plants. Um, but then over time, what will happen is it'll, this preference changes. So plant first gets infected, the psyllids want to go to that infected plant. As the plant seems to get a little sicker, the insects move. And what this does is it means that they're going to spread the pathogen through the fields, right? Because they're going to pick it up on this early plant and then move off to the uninfected plants with the pathogen. Okay. Here's the problem. All of these studies, they're all looking at the pathogen and its own vector, right? They're looking at the, the, the uh, psyllid and the pathogen it carries, or the aphid and the pathogen it carries. But almost everybody in this room has been in a field before. And everybody knows that a field isn't homogenous. We sort of think of it as one big field, uh, expanse of green, but it's not, right? It has lots of insects that we worry about. And some of those are vectors and some of them are not. And it's got lots of pathogens, and it's got pesticides, and it's got sick plants and unsick plants. And it makes for a mosaic, right? The whole field has all kinds of things going on. There's more than one problem. And so what we were think, starting to think about is, what if you have this sort of standard thing that we're used to, right? The insect and the pathogen and the plant, and we have a second pathogen, which, which happens, right? Everyone who's walked through the field knows that they don't have just the one pathogen in the field. And so this is actually tobacco mosaic virus. And I show that because this is the system that we used to ask these questions, right? What if we add another pathogen? How is it going to change? the way the insects move through the field, and will that change the way the pathogens spread through the field? Okay. So to get at this, we use sort of a simple version of this kind of scenario. So we have tomato plants, we have the psyllids, we have LSO, and we have tobacco mo mosaic virus, which is you know, a common virus on solanaceous plants. It attacks potatoes, it attacks tomatoes, and it's very well studied, and it's easy to work with. Using this system, we did a whole bunch of experiments, and you've seen variations on this in other talks I've given. So we have two choice experiments to start with. And these are simple. They have a cage. We have a plant that has TMV that we inoculated by hand, and then we have um, plants without it. And then, then we, have, we went into those plants. We looked where the insects are over time, and then we looked where they laid their eggs. We have no choice bioassays. We've seen these before in versions as well. Basically, we cage the insect onto the plant, right? So they have no option but to either use the plant they're on or not do anything. Same idea. They can count eggs, uh, rather, after we're done, we count the eggs, and then we follow them to, to see how well they develop, right? So can they use these sick plants to become adults? After we do this, we collect the plants, and we do these transmission bioassays. 
So what we did is we have TMV infected and uninfected plants. And then we looked to see if when the psyllids land on a plant that has TMV, are you more or less likely to get LSO? And this is the important part, right? This is the key to the whole thing. So we tested that using qPCR. And then after we did all of that, we took all these plants and we gave them to Chris, who, um, you know, because he's your fair neighborhood biochemist, did all kinds of biochemistry um, to look at the responses of the plants with TMV and without it to see if we can get a feel for what was causing the insects to do what they were doing. Right. So we'll work you through the stats, or the, the results. So these are these choice bioassays, right? So just remember, in each case, you have a choice of a plant that's infected with TMV or, TMV or one that doesn't. So at 24, 48, 72, and 96 hours, we went in and we looked to see where the insects are. And what you find is in every instance, the insects prefer the plants that aren't infected with TMV. So if you have the tobacco mosaic virus, the insects don't like it. They would rather be on the plants that aren't sick. Okay? If you go and look where they lay their eggs after you do that, you get a similar thing. So if you have tobacco mosaic virus, they don't land on the plant as much. And they also don't lay as many eggs on that plant, right? They'd rather use healthy plants. Now, if you give them no choice in the matter, you get something very similar. That is, even if they have no choice, they would still rather not lay eggs on these infected plants. Right? So they don't have any option. They can either lay on this plant or they can not use it at all. And relative to a happy um, tobacco, tomato plant, they don't want to use it as much. Okay. Now, if they do lay eggs on these plants, we can evaluate sort of how well those eggs become adults, right? So this is a, a growth index. You'll see this again, I think, when uh, um, Rich talks. Um, simple way to think about it, if you have a score of zero right down here, it means that any egg that's laid never gets to be a grown-up. It never makes, becomes an adult. A one means all of the eggs that are laid reaches adult, right? And anything in between is some portion. So what you find is that there's basically no difference. And what this means is that even though there's a preference in where they're going to lay their eggs, whatever eggs are laid are equally likely to become an adult. So the psyllids aren't making choices based on their ability to develop on a plant. An egg, an egg laid on a sick plant doesn't become an adult any more likely than when it's not. But they can definitely determine that they don't like plants that are infected with tobacco mosaic virus. All right. Now, here's the part that probably matters most to most of us. So these are these transmission biases, right? So what this is, is we took the insects, we know they're LSO positive, we cage them onto the plants, and the plant either does have TMV or it doesn't have TMV. Right? So the plants are already a little bit sick, although not highly symptomatic. Put the insects on, and then look what happens. So this is proportion, right? Um, so basically, black is the portions that are positive, and white is negative. And what you find is that if the plants have TMV, they're a little bit less likely to be infected with LSO than a regular plant. So right, uninfected plants, somewhere near 90%, basically all of the plants, or all but a couple, are going to come up hot when you test them by qPCR. Um, if they're infected with the mosaic virus, you get a smaller proportion. A bunch of them aren't actually going to be hot. And if we look at this by CT value, right? so the way to think of this, for those of you who may not be used to the CT value, is that a higher CT value means less bacteria, basically. right? What you find is the uninfected plants, the ones that don't have tobacco mosaic virus, um, have actually lower CT values, which means they have more bacteria. Right? So the insects are, putting are transmitting the bacteria better to the uninfected plants than to the sick plants. Okay. So we took all of this data and all of these plants, and we gave them to Chris. And he ran them through his HLP, HPLC, and he took a look at a whole bunch of different amino acids. And what we found is that when you look just at amino acids, with primary metabolites, there's not much difference. The proline differs, but it doesn't seem to make much of a difference, and there's no particular pattern to it. You look at secondary metabolites. Remember, that all these things are responses of the plant to being sick in one form or another. It's defending itself. Same, similar thing. We find some variation with infection, but there's no clear trend to what's happening. Some things go up, some things go down. Um, it's not anything distinct, with one exception. When you look at monoterpenoids, what you find is eucalyptol 
um, is much, much higher in the tobacco mosaic virus infected plants. Now, remember, the insects don't like plants that have TMV. And eucalyptol, it turns out, is both insecticidal and repellent. It's very, very repellent. So one thing that may be happening is that when these plants get sick, they're producing a bunch of these um, monoterpenoids. And some of them, the insects don't like, including this eucalyptol. And so it's possible that what we're seeing is a response of the insect where, because the plant is sick, it's picking up on this eucalyptol and doesn't like it, and it leaves or avoids the plant. But the other possibility is that when you go in and you start looking at the sugar, so we did this a couple times, and the second time we didn't find as much of a difference. Um, this is for some complicated reasons that we can talk about. But the important part is if you look at the sugars, um, both fructose and glucose, in uh, control plants and the infected plants, there's much more less sugar in the TMV infected plants, and that's both fructose and glucose. The insects get their nutrition from the sugars that are in these plants, right? The insects are sucking on the plants, they're, they're on the flow, they're collecting all the sugar, that's how they eat. So the other possibility, and they're not mutually exclusive, that may be happening here is that when the plants get TMV, because they have less sugar, they're not as healthy for the insects. They don't like them. It doesn't taste as good. And so the insects don't want to lay eggs on them as much, and they don't want to stay there. And so they're leaving in search of um, these happy plants that are basically more nutritious for them. OK. So here are the conclusions that from this sort of, if we bring this all down. Basically, if you infect plants with TMV, what's going to happen is it's going to alter the cell behavior. And they're basically going to go to the uninfected plants. Um, and we think that that has some combination of, is because of some combination of this reduced amount of sugars in the infected plants, and also maybe because of this high, these high levels of eucalyptol. But I promise you that there's some real reasons that this matters. And here's why. The first is that we may be able to use eucalyptol as a repellent. So John Diaz Montana did a whole bunch of studies looking at different uh, essential oils from plants, some of which are repellent. But eucalyptol wasn't one of the ones he looked at. Um, and it's not one we ever tested to see if we can use it as an actual management tool in the field. But it's possible that we can load um, this into the matrix that we've talked about in the past as a repellent scent to apply to fields. So that's one reason that we care. Second reason, and the second one actually the important one, is that there's a couple different groups that are thinking about using TMV to deliver RNAi into plants, right? So the idea is that they have these RNAi's that will attack the insect. And you have to get it into the plant so that the insect can consume it. And the way they want to do that is by using TMV as sort of a delivery mechanism. And in the one study that's looked at this real carefully so far, what they found is that when they put TMV into the plants loaded with their RNAi, they found less eggs. And it turns out that it may actually not be because of the RNAi at all. So they thought what was happening was making less e it was causing the insects to produce less eggs. But in fact, if you think about what I'm just showing you, it may just be because the insects don't like those plants very much. Now, the other reason this is real important is that if the insects aren't going to feed on plants that are infected with TMV, they're not going to pick up the RNAi, which means it's kind of like having a repellent pesticide, right? You're not going to kill the insects because they're not going to eat enough of the pesticide, although they may avoid the plant because they don't like it. And so. This has some real uh, implications into how you're going to use this tool if we're going to use it. You may have to find a uh, weak strain of the TMV that won't cause the same kinds of symptoms, or you may have to use a different way of delivering it. So it's more important than you think. And then probably the most important thing is that is the disease spread, right? We're always talking about trying to figure out, you know, give more and more tools to figure out how this pathogen, how things are going to move through the field. And what this suggests is that it's not something is that if you have other things in your field, it's going to change how the insects move. And in the simplest form, it says that you can't just think about one problem in your field, right? You have to think about all of them. Because if you have TMV and, and maybe you know, spotted wilt virus or PBY or something, it may change how badly the rest of your field is going to get infected as these insects move through it. Um, and so, this is the first study of anything like this we kind of know of. The only other things that are even close to this are around um, Punya and Chapa's looked at uh, spider mites, and they have some kind of similar responses. So it's a problem, and it's sort of an ecologically interesting thing, but it's also something that we really have to kind of start playing with as we move to using TMV maybe as a delivery mechanism. So um, the last thing we want to know is why we get these different responses 
with, you know, more specifically with the virus infected and uninfected plants. Because it may be that we can, if we can figure out exactly what they're queuing on to, to make these choices about going to and not going to the plants, we can take advantage of that itself in some of our breeding programs and figure out what it is that they don't like and then, you know, get the plants to produce that potentially to make more um, repellent varieties of their plants directly. So, okay. Usual thanks to all the different people that helped us do these experiments and reared tomatoes and ground virus into plants 